Well, have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to finish up tonight on Noah and the flood. I'll preach this morning just to begin to open up this, this passage on Noah and the flood. Like I mentioned this morning, you can't go to church very long as a young person not hear about Noah and the flood or see a flannel graph seat up on the screen acting it out and, and uh, maybe moms and dads, you've done this for family devotions and you get to be, to be the monkey in Noah and the flood. I did see a little cartoon about this and I saw those two monkeys there and a, obviously a husband and a wife and, and the wife is saying to your husband, Harold, this is going to be wonderful, a 40-day cruise and no children. you got a great rate on this. I can't wait. I hope it doesn't rain. You'll get it. And, uh, and uh, lots of other things, I, I, the, the quips about the flood and, and things like that. And mentioned this morning that often in a storm, our lives can feel like the flood. Rains, it pours, and one thing followed by another. Trouble comes in threes. And, and we're quick to complain and be pessimistic about life. And we compare it to the flood and, and things like that. This last week in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, they had an issue with some real flood. And was it 17 inches in seven minutes? Did I read that correctly or something like that? Did I, anybody else read that article? Apparently not. That's wonderful. Um, and they had an astronomical amount of rain very quickly, and a dam broke right there. And uh, boy, and, and people are worried about that. In Michigan, we don't have that problem as much. All right, here a little bit higher. But I remember a few years back when the Cass River was an issue, and that flood was, was going to be a problem. And, uh, but this point, this flood was a little bit different in history, was it not? Um, it was not one that anyone but Noah saw coming. I mentioned this morning that Noah knew from God the flood was coming, but no one else knew that. You see, you stay close to God and you find out things other people don't know. The Bible teaches that in Psalm chapter 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. That, that phrase, there's a secret, the secret counsel of the Lord. As you read the Bible, you know things that others don't. You know the end time is coming. Other people don't know that without the Bible. All right, if you read your Old Testament way back in prophecy time, you would have find out about these things before they happened. See, the Lord knows all these things, and no one knew the flood was coming. This morning we looked at very briefly how God monitored, and he looks and he saw everything. He saw no one, he saw the wickedness. We saw God's mandate. We also saw God's man, and uh, really emphasized heavily Noah this morning, and how just one person, I'll talk a little more tonight, but just one person can save a family. And if you don't believe that, then don't waste your time coming to church. Okay, because if we don't believe anything, God can use one person to save a family and save a whole group and section, even the world. And Noah himself saved his family. And I mentioned this morning, a dad can save a family. And a spiritual dad who is dedicated to walking with God can save a family. A mom can save a family. I know of people who, 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 who the fathers are maybe way off the deep end, but mom is, is true to God and, and, and true to, to, to God's word and brings her children faithful to church, and, and those kids turn out for the Lord. Why? Because a mom saved the family. No other families where a grandmother prayed and saved the family. I even mentioned this morning, uh, Joseph, a child, saved his family. And see... One person can save a family, and God is looking for people to use to save others. But tonight, if you would look in Genesis chapter number 6, where we find the account of Noah in 6, 7, 8, Noah and the flood, I want to look at another aspect tonight about the flood. And let's look at, though, verse number 5 of Genesis chapter 6. We'll start there. In verse number 5 of Genesis 6, the Bible says, And God saw the wickedness. Of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the, of the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also, also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Interesting that, that the Bible would, would emphasize not just a corruptness and the perversion of people, but that violence was a key mark of those times. And one of the things that upset the Lord was the violence in the whole earth. Is it safe to say we live in a violent time as well? I think there were 31 killed in Chicago, I think, yesterday. Saginaw is not the safest place known to man, but it's not the most dangerous as well. 
There are wars and rumors of wars. We're not living in a non-violent, we're living in a violent time. And, and the Bible emphasis, emphasizes this here. Not only was it corrupt and perverted, but it was violent. It was filled in the earth. Verse number 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Here's where God spoke to Noah. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse number 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this account. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look at your word to understand it. But Lord, may we go beyond understanding. May we live it. Would you touch us? Lord, may our hearts be open to what you'd have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago... Before he was involved in this uh, uh, legal dispute and these moral problems, Bill Cosby had a comedy routine on Noah and the Flood. Now, anyone remember Bill Cosby? Date yourself? Okay, I actually remember this. Okay, anybody remember this little count of Noah and the Flood? It was quite humorous the way that Bill Cosby portrayed this. He kind of portrayed it that Noah was sitting there one day and God came and said, hey, you know, hey, Noah. And he's, he acted like, like Noah was looking around and eventually he said, you know, it's me. I'm up here. I want you to build me an ark. And he said, right. You know, make it this big. Right. He said, it's going to rain. And, and uh, so it was pretty, pretty humorous about that. But we read this and I looked at this and I want to talk tonight, first of all, that inside of this huge flood after God's man and God's mandate, we have God's mercy. We have God's mercy. And I find this mercy on display in full colors in this chapter. And right here, that little phrase where God says to Noah, make me an ark of gopher wood. I think we could all agree that we would see God's mercy in the ark. Would we not, yes or no? Yes? We'd say, you know, Noah Noah got himself an ark. Man, that's kind of cool. But is it really that cool? Begin to study and look at this passage and, man, I begin to think, what if you were Noah? And you're a just man, you're perfect, you walk with God, and and God comes to you one day and says, listen, here you are in Saginaw, Michigan, and the earth is filled with violence. I'm going to destroy the earth, but I'm going to save you, so I want you to build something. Now, if you were like most people, you would not have chosen the ark. If it was me and God said, listen, I'm going to send a flood, I'm asking for a luxury yacht. That's what I'm asking for. I want something with a few different decks to it that I can relax and have a hot tub on the top deck, all right, and slide out there. I want a yacht. I want something with a big motor. All right, this ark had no motor. You couldn't paddle the ark. You had to float. I want something with an engine on there, and the bigger engine, the the, the better, right? Come on, men. Help me out here. And then not better than one motor. There's two motors on this thing. All right, and let's see how fast this thing will go, and let's ski behind the ark. All right, we wakeboard, and no, get back on the boat. All right. Shem, put your life jacket on. That's, the, that's uh, Noah's wife yelling out the back of the ark. But God didn't send an ark to Noah either, did he? He didn't say, hey, Noah, you're going to walk down the street and you're going to find an ark outside. That's your ark. Use it. What did he tell him to do? <laughs> Build it. Build it. Now, picture for a moment or imagine for a moment if Noah ever responded in his flesh. He built this boat, and he had to cut down all the wood for it. He built this boat, and he had to mix all the tar for it. He built this boat, and every board he or his sons placed in the right place it was supposed to go and hammered it in place. And imagine the back-breaking work it would have been to build a huge, over 500-foot vessel Piece by piece by piece. You wonder if one morning Noah wakes up and I'm like, come on. I never asked to flood the world. All right, remember, I'm the righteous one here. All right, and, he said, and I wonder if Noah ever had a pity party. And like, why did I get stuck building this stupid ark? You know, God, you built the whole earth. You could have built an ark for me. Wouldn't have been that hard. You could have had the trees grow closer to my house. All right, they could just pop up every morning. But no, instead, God said, God said, Noah, you have a task to do. I'm going to save you and your family, but there is something that you have to do. It's going to cause some pain in your life. This wasn't just an easy task, but this was God's mercy. You all said that. The ark was God's mercy. 
Yet God said, listen, there's something here that you have to do. There's something here that you have to perform. There's something here that's going to cost you something in order to, to see my mercy in full effect. You see, if I can get, tell you this phrase, we often want out of a situation, but God wants to take us through it. You know what? I wonder if Noah had, had the thought. I doubt he did. But he said, you know what, Lord? Why don't you not send the flood? Because that's how we pray. The doctor comes back and the doctor says, I'm sorry, but it's cancer. How do we pray? Lord, take the cancer away. We don't want God to take us through it. We want God to take us out of it. And God said to Noah, or gave to Noah, not the ability to be out of it, but to go through it. You see, often the things that we think are bad, God is using as a vessel of mercy in our life. Often the things that we don't understand, that we think, God, why did you allow this flood to come in my life, is actually the very vessel that God is using us to show his mercy. This afternoon, we had the, the privilege to take out that young couple that was here on their honeymoon. All right, they, they, they on their honeymoon and came here to church. And that's wonderful. Took them to lunch. They're telling us their story, how they met. And uh, she mentioned, the girl mentioned, Hudson mentioned, they're on their way to, to Bible college. He's going to Heartland this year. So Austin, his name is uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus and Hudson. And uh, man, uh, went on a road trip for three weeks. But they, she mentioned how, how she never would have met him had her mom not had a, had a cancer scare. The house was sold. They were planning on moving. Because of that, that issue, they changed their plans. And it wasn't but what, honey, two months later that Marcus came into their life, and now they're married, and he's going off to Bible college. And the thing that, that we would have said, that's not a good thing, that's a hard thing, was actually the vessel of mercy. It was actually the very instrument used to put them together. You see, often the situations that we think are bad, God means for good. There are vessels of mercy. I found a couple of things here that I don't think God was in, but Walt Disney. In 1990, Walt Disney, the founder of Walt Disney, and, and who in America doesn't know Walt Disney, at least the stupid little Mickey Mouse. Walt Disney was fired from the Kansas City Star newspaper. He was fired because, according to his editor, he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Boy, I want his lack of, uh, of imagination and, and his lack of ideas. I take just one or two of those. Because there isn't anyone in the world who would say that Disney has not been imaginative or had good ideas. He took that, I don't think from the Lord, I don't think he was a Christian, but he took that bad situation, went off to found the Disney Corporation. And there were two men, Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank. They were working for a home improvement chain called Handy Dan, and they were both fired. So they, started to, so they decided to start their own home improvement store based on an idea they'd had at Handy Dan. They called it Home Depot. And maybe you've seen the orange box store before. In less than a decade, they'd over, they, they had opened over 100 stores and made over $2.7 billion in under 10 years. And by the way, during that time, Handy Dan, the one they were fired from, had shut down. But then I think of Joseph, what his vessel looked like. Slavery to prison to second in command. I think of the widow Zarephath and her vessel was empty. There was nothing left in her little vessel until it wasn't. And the next day it wasn't and the next day it wasn't. You see, the very thing that we think is going to be tough, the very thing that we think is, it shouldn't be there, may be the very vessel that God is using to show his mercy in our life. You see, it's a different perspective. It changes this account. We look at Noah in the flood and say, Noah, man, you had an ark. Wow, that's so cool, really? Really, you want to be stuck with stinking animals? This is really great. Anybody ever get car sick or seasick? Can you imagine being on the ark and those waves over the whole earth and just being tossed to them? Oh, really? This was great. The jobs they had on the ark, now they got saved, but I don't, I don't think this, was a, this wasn't a vacation for them. I don't think after they said, hey, let's go take another ark trip. I think they're happy to see it parked on Mount Ararat and that part of their life done, but they wouldn't have traded it. You see, the very vessel we think is a problem may be God's mercy. 
Maybe tonight in your life, you've seen a problem where God's trying to show mercy. And he brought this along because he said, I'm bringing you over here. Just go through it. I want to put you over here, but you got to go through this. I'm going to take you through it. You see, God not only had plans for salvation, he had plans for sustaining Noah. Because not only was it his vessel where I see his mercy, but I see the timing. As I studied this out, I, I realized something again. Noah got stuck on that boat for a long time. Now, how long was the flood? Come on here, you know, come help me here. 40 days, 40 nights. So how long was Noah on the, flood, on the boat? Anybody know? I'm going to tell you, it was a long time. We won't read every verse, but let me kind of walk you through it on the timing. In verse 13 of chapter 6, Noah was commanded to build the ark. Verse 13 of chapter number 6. Chapter number 7, verse number 1, the Lord commands Noah to go inside of the ark. Boy, what a day that would have been. God came back to Noah. It doesn't appear much that God spoke to Noah during that time frame. Now, some may say it took 120 years. I don't know that it took Noah that long to build the ark. But somewhere in there, they're building it, and one day God shows up and says, Noah, time to go in the ark. Boy grabs his family, grabs the kids and their wives, and the animals are now there, and they jump on the ark. And you got to wonder what they thought. Is it coming? They'd never seen rain before, never heard rain before. And there's some windows on there, obviously, when they sent the dove out and rain out, so maybe they're looking outside. And, and maybe one of their friends came by, or somebody came by to laugh at Noah again. They couldn't find him. You know, Noah, Ham, Shem, Javed, where are you? We're in the boat. What are you doing in the boat, man? God told us to get in here. What if he ran back to his house? Mom and Dad, they're in the boat. It's, the door is shut. This is crazy. The Bible tells us in verse number 11. I'm sorry, verse number 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And for seven days, they're in this boat with the door shut, okay, and nothing happening. Nothing going on. Uh, Dad, is this some funny joke? Dad, you playing a trick on us here? No, son, the flood's coming. Honey, honey, are you sure it was God? I thought it was. Day number two, day number three, day number four. Can you imagine that seven-day wait? That would have been a long wait. That seventh day, you hear this plop, plop. Plop, plop, uh-oh, honey, honey, shut, shut the window, it's coming. And seven days later, the flood begins. The Bible says that it was in the Noah's 600th year, the 17th day of the second month. Now, it wasn't, but let's just call that February 17th. Can we do that, just for sake of illustration? So Noah was 600, and February 17th, he's on this boat now, and rain is now coming. So 40 days and 40 days and nights of flood, that tells us in verse 12 and verse 17 of, of chapter 7. All right, after that ends, it took five months, five months in uh, chapter 20, or ch verse 24 of chapter 7, the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. It took five months, the seventh month and 17th day, and the ark finally rested on Mount Ararat. So after these 40 days and 40 nights of just pure, just absolute, just tumultuous winds and waves, all right, there's about another 150 days, five months, where the boat's just floating. And the boat finally rests on Mount Ararat. But the Bible then tells us, in verse 8, verse 5, that it took another, another five months, okay, until the 10th month, in the 10th, in verse number 5 of chapter 8, or another three months to the 10th month now, that they could see anything. So after three more months, the 10th month, now you could finally see the top of mountains. So now you've been in there from February, now we're to the 10th month, let's say it's October, until you actually see a top of a mountain. But they're not done yet. It was at least 40 days, that's verse number 6 of chapter 8, that Noah began to send out ravens. 
So now he's sending out ravens. They're going there, coming back, going there, coming back, and still nothing's happening. Finally, finally, in verse number 8, he sends out doves as well. And the dove finally comes back with an, with an olive branch. So seven more days, he sent the dove out again in verse number 12 of chapter 8. And the, ark, and the dove didn't come back. So now in verse number 13, if you look in chapter 8 of verse 13, it says it came to pass in the 601st year. So one year, the first day of the first month, that their waters were dried up from the earth. So he was, if we can, 600 and February 17th. As he was 601 on the first day of the first month, the waters were dried up on the earth, and Noah finally removed the covering of the ark. But he's still on the ark. He's still on the ark. Now they can see out there. That was verse number 13. And verse number 14, And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. In verse 15, And God spake unto Moa, saying, so he went in on February, if we can, February 17th at 600. They got off, if we can, at 601, February 27th, which just happened to be my birthday, in case you're wondering. All right, make sure you write that down, right? That's the whole purpose of the sermon, write that down right there. No, I'm just kidding. Now, it wasn't February, but that was the second month, 27th day. So a year and 10 days, he and his family are on this stinking boat with these stinking animals. And then God spoke to him again and said, you can get off the boat finally. When Noah got on that boat, I guarantee he never thought he'd be on there for a whole year. I don't think he imagined he'd be stuck on there with his family's animals for a year. For a year. And at a time when they're waiting for the rain to begin, and, and then after the rain stops, 40 days is done, like, man, okay, all right, Dad, we get off the boat? It's, it's just like today. The kids were asking, Dad, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Oh, I don't know. Let's look. Okay, I think we're in a bathtub right now. There's all water everywhere. I wonder if he thought, what are we going to do? Are we going to be on here forever? Will this water ever go down? And you feel that boat, you wake up, and it's on Mount Ararat, big old maybe rumbling through the boat. Honey, what's happened? You look outside, boy, we hit something. I told you to let me drive. That's what she said. But a year and ten days later. And God's timing was not Noah's timing, was it? And can I submit this? God's timing will not be your timing or my timing. Ever. It will not be what you want it to be. I promise you. All right. I have offered the Lord to buy him a watch. Because the Lord operates on his own time. Does he not? Does he not solve problems when he wants to? I, the Lord, sitteth in the heavens. Scripture says, Psalmist says, he doeth whatsoever he will. And sometimes we think, God, you've forgotten about me, but it's God's timing. And I see his mercy and his timing because he, here's the deal. The food never ran out. The kids got sick. They were fine. The animals didn't die. And God not only saved them, he sustained them for a year and ten days. The animals stayed put. The family was okay. And God took, took care of them every single day you couldn't help but wake up and not see God's provision and Noah was in a place that we need to place ourselves and that is in the middle of God's mercy and God's grace Noah only had one option or he had two options he could stay in the boat or he'd go swimming and the second one didn't look that good can I submit that in our life we only have two options we can either stay in the boat or go swimming but how many people do you know and I know who are Christians who decide to go swimming? Who say, you know what, I can't handle it. Do you know how long this has been, Pastor Howell? Do you know how long we've dealt with this? Do you know how long? And listen, can I, can I say something? Can you wait just one more day? Can you wait just one more month? Can you wait one more hour? Wait a little bit longer? Because the boat's going to stop. All right, the water's going to dry up. The ground's going to get dry. You're going to get back out of the boat. Right? It's going to be over, but just hold on. All right, wait a little bit longer. God's protecting you. He's providing for you. And God's provision, his help, was inside that ark. It was right there. And if they had jumped out of that ark, they were on their own. They could have. No one made them stay. No one made them stay. They could have jumped out, but they didn't. Because they saw in a real way that God's provision was right there. Can I say something, Christian? God still offers the same provision and help in your life and my life. And his timing will not look like my timing or what I want it to be. But it's no less his mercy. 
And when you look back, you say, wow. You look on the hill and you say, wow, look at that ark. Look what God did. You remember those days? And I would submit, because we've done this in our life, those times that we think are the worst times, we look back sometimes with the fondest memories and say, boy, I remember that time. Do you remember when Sham threw up all over the place? That was disgusting. You've done that as a family, haven't you, after a vacation like that? Oh, man, I still remember an early vacation with James, and, and uh, we're driving, and all of a sudden the, the, the DVD player in the van quit. And within about five minutes, he threw up everywhere all over the place. And I did what any man in his right mind would do. I pulled over, and I, at the nearest Walmart, and I bought one. Right then, I bought another one. And it was the best $68 I spent the entire trip. But we still look back with fondness on that. Wow, look at that. I can't remember when James threw up. You don't remember when everything went okay. You, you remember when those things happened. I remember camping with, with my family, and, and for whatever reason, we did not have great success with my, my, my parents and brothers and sisters camping. There were seven, of course, seven kids. I still remember the storm of the century with my grandmother. Okay, and our tent is leaking right on my head. Andy, it's to this day why I hate leaky tents. Because I hate waking up to water dripping on it. It's like Chinese torture. All right, and your parents who have leaky tents, sell them, please. Sell them to some other unsuspecting victim, all right? And let them have leaky tents. But those are the things you remember. And I wonder if they looked back, they looked back and said, listen, that ark, remember those days? Boy, they were tough. Boy, that boat, it was rocking all over the place. Boy, those animals, they stunk. Woo, that was, that was bad. But we got to see God work. And God's timing showed his mercy. Not only do we see the vessel of God's mercy, the time of God's mercy, but we see the mark in the rainbow. One of the most familiar parts of the flood, verse number 20, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. You know, he knew to do that because he knew before to do that. Noah had walked with God. Verse 21 of chapter 8, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done, while the earth remaineth in seed time, and harvest and cold and heat in summer, and winter and day and night shall not cease. You remember a covenant, and he placed in the clouds a bow. Verse number 13 of chapter 9, I do set a bow in the clouds. I think it was Thursday morning. I was studying for this sermon. My wife calls. She just left to bring Johnny to soccer practice. She goes, honey, you got to run outside real quick. And over our feet, over the field, Brother Bezos' field right there, there was a double rainbow. I don't know if anyone else saw that Thursday morning. And I saw the bright, I mean, it was one of the brightest rainbows I've seen in a while here. Man, just brightened right behind it, another rainbow. I couldn't help but think, because I was studying for this sermon right here. Lord, 6,000, 8,000 plus years later, I can look outside and I can be reminded of your mercy. I look outside and I see a rainbow in the sky. I don't think there's a pot of gold, though. I wish there was. Now, a little leprechaun running down there. No, I look outside and see a rainbow and I see God's help. You say, well, why did God do, use a rainbow? Why did God use a symbol? Isn't God's word good enough? Of course it is. It ought to be. Isn't what he says good enough? Yes, it is. But he knows what we're like, doesn't he? He knows that sometimes we're frail. Sometimes we're weak. Sometimes we doubt. So he says, I'm going to put something outside. So that every time you look outside after a rainstorm, when the sun re refracts right against the water, the clouds, you're going to see something. And I put that there. And I saw that rainbow. I actually took a picture on my phone and showed it to Pastor Dylan. I said, man, you won't believe it. I saw the rainbow this morning. But I had to wonder, as pretty as that rainbow was, and I've seen some pretty pictures, what did that first rainbow look like? That was probably the, the best rainbow of all time when the Lord put that bow in the sky. Beautiful colors, deep. They'd never seen one before. I wonder if they just stood there and gazed at it. Wow. <laughs> look at that rainbow. Can you believe that? That's, the Lord did that. He just painted the sky for us. Kids, that's God. I wonder if later on, when Ham or Japheth had some kids, their own kids, and one day a rainbow popped up in the sky, and they said, hey, boys, oh, Dad, we know. We know. It's not the flood story again, is it? 
Oh, yeah, we know, we know. Remember, hey, I'm threw up. We remember this, Dad. Thanks a lot. Oh, boy, see that rainbow? Don't you forget that rainbow. That's what God did. Don't you forget that. That's your promise of your God. That's just not my God and your grandpa Noah's God. That's got to be your God. One of Shem one day is hoeing outside, looks up and sees that rainbow. He pauses for a moment with his hoe and says, thank you, thank you, thank you again. You see, not only did we see God's vessel and his timing, but we see God's symbol. And I tell you what, it is great to look back and see God's mercy in life. Because we need it, not, you need it, and I need it. Because sometimes, sometimes life feels like a flood. But God always sends a vessel during the flood. And in that flood, his timing is not your timing, but God always wants to take you through it, not take you out of it. And when you're done, you can remember what God has done. I'll give you a few thoughts, a few closing thoughts about God's message from the flood. First thought is this in God's message. God is always looking for people who will stand and follow him. God is always looking for people who will stand and follow him. Boy, it was Noah, but what if there had been five or ten? What if there had been six families who were gathering together to worship the Lord? What if there had been a whole church? Would God have spared the earth? And God is always looking for those people who will stand and follow him. Bring to the second point, it is possible and always possible to live for God even in the worst of circumstances. You say you got it bad at work, you don't have it as bad as Noah. Noah, the, the, Lord, the Lord says, the Lord says every imagination was wicked. Every thought was evil. So I don't care how bad you think your boss is or how filthy a mouth you think he has, it wasn't as bad as the whole earth being filled and corrupt and filled with violence. Noah had it bad. His kids are asking, Dad, why can't we do anything? Kids, because the earth is terrible. Dad, everyone else gets to, and it is always possible to live for God. If anyone would have been able to have an excuse, it would have been Noah. Everybody's doing it. Was never truer than in the days of Noah. And yet Noah stood as a beacon of righteousness. And so it doesn't matter how bad you think you have it or how bad the circumstances around you are, it is still possible, always possible, to live for God. In the New Testament Hebrews, it tells us that Noah moved by fear to the saving of his family. And he became a preacher of righteousness so that by his act, he condemned the world. By his very actions, he condemned the rest of the world. A while back, um, my kids play, they still play AYSO soccer. In this soccer program, it's in Frankenmuth. They go and they, you know, they do. I've told you about it before. And, you know, the little kids don't keep score. But we as a family, we still keep score because we're scorekeepers. <clears throat> and uh, we're the people who cheer when the, the goals are going. And other parents look at us, you know, with shame. Like, oh, you terrible people. You're going to hurt the kid's psyche and probably are. And so that's just life, all right? They'll be in counseling later on, so that's okay. Um, but, but early on, someone had asked me, they said, you know, Brother Howell, would you consider not having your kids play Anyway, so soccer, and I appreciated the question, and I said, well, well what are you thinking? Uh, you know, what are you asking me? And they, and they said, well, we're afraid that, that if you do this, that perhaps some people will, will play as well, but then they will not go to church when there's a game, a soccer game conflicting. We told our kids early on, we said, listen, we said, uh, if there's ever a conflict between church and soccer, church is more important. I should probably repeat that. We told our kids early on, there's ever conflict between church and soccer, that church is more important. Amen. Thank you, because church is always more important. We told our coaches early on the same thing. In fact, they moved a, a couple games, like, apparently, um, for, for the boys so they could play with them. I went back to this person, and I appreciate their honest question. You can always ask me those questions. And, and I prayed about it, and I went to the back, and I said, listen, I said, I'm going to let my kids play for this reason, or for two reasons, actually. One, I want my kids to be able to be a witness. In fact, Johnny let his first boy to the Lord, the boy who was on a soccer team. Okay. But I said, also, I want to be able to, to show that, that you can do this and still hold a testimony for the Lord. And it's not been a problem. They've missed some soccer games. But soccer is not as important as Jesus Christ. Soccer is not as important as, as this place right here. I know it's just a building we gather in, 
right? The church is the people, but I love this place. I'm talking about this building. I love this place. I love being here. I travel sometimes on vacation and gone to some other churches. I love being right at First Baptist Church. I love the people I see out here in the fellowship and to the, find out, hey, how's it going with this or how's that going? And, and I mean, how'd that work out? And you did this, you did that, we're praying for that. How that. I like that kind of thing, a family we have right here. And that's what a church is. And this is way more important than kicking a soccer ball down the field and scoring. And believe me, I love soccer and I love cheering and I love watching my kids play. But that's not as important as what we're doing right here. And don't tell me that that's going to be more. That, listen, listen, pleasing the Lord is the most important thing we do. And Noah had to make choices that were not popular in order to stand for Jesus Christ, to, to stand for God. They weren't popular. We know that because the whole world was corrupt, only Noah wasn't. So what he was doing was not popular. It could have been popular, yet he still made those choices. So dads, it's okay if you make an unpopular choice, as long as it's God's choice. It's okay if it's unpopular everywhere else in the world, just make sure it's God's choice. It's okay if it's unpopular in your family. I guarantee those boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, did not want to help dad build the ark at first. At some point, they were teenage boys. Most likely, they were born at some point inside of this story because the oldest one was 102 at the end. The very beginning, God said roughly 120, though it may have not have been the whole time. So somewhere in there, these boys are growing up, and they're getting dragged outside to help dad. And Noah is consumed with building the ark, so he's not consumed with helping keep the house up with his wife. This was not a popular thing, but you know what? In those 40 days and 40 nights, it was really popular, wasn't it? In the middle of that flood, they were really thankful dad took a stand for righteousness. They were really thankful that dad said, you know what? I don't care what the whole world is doing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So don't tell me it's too hard. Don't tell me, well, my wife won't let me. Don't tell me there's no one else making these decisions, so it must be okay. Don't tell me, well, my kids are convincing me to do this. It is, it is possible to live for God and stand for God even in the worst of circumstances. And there is no excuse. There is no excuse. You see, if Noah hadn't lived that way, he would have died like everybody else. And he would have been a nameless face, just part of the, quote, earth, the whole earth. But because Noah was different, the scripture said, but Noah. So it's possible to live for God even in the worst of circumstances. Next thought is this. Our grieving should typically precede our judgment. I mentioned this this morning. I'll spend just a little bit of time on it tonight. But in verse number five, we see the scripture says that God was repented in his heart that he'd made man. And he was grieved. What it means is not that he changed his mind, but that the, the scripture means that he sighed. <sighs> he was sad. I mentioned this morning that when Brother Swain was, and I were talking one day, he said, J.D., let your kids see your grief, not just your anger. And that stuck with me these 17, 18 years later. He told me that before I was married, before I had kids. And it still has stuck with me that my kids don't need to just see my anger, my wrath, though this is a picture. I mean, God's wrath was on full display in this thing, the flooding of the world. But that it began with God's grief. He was vexed in his heart. He, his heart ached because of the sinfulness of man. His heart ached because of the wrong choices. His heart ached because what he saw was corruption. And so when we see corruption in our children or corruption in our friends or corruption in a marriage or decay in a place, rather than our anger and our irritation, how about we show our grief? How it hurts. How it's just like, oh, man. You know what? You, you hurt daddy. You hurt mommy. They know what anger looks like, don't they? They know what grief looks like. Yeah, I've seen my daddy grieve because the lion's lost. But maybe you show more grief when your sports team loses than when your kids make a mistake. Yeah, I saw mommy grieve because her phone wasn't working. She couldn't get on Facebook. And yet some people are a lot more grieved about that than they are about their kids or family members or co-workers. 
or neighbors who are lost and going to hell. May others see our grief. May in Saginaw they know a church who grieves for the lost. You remember the church Westboro Baptist, and they would and they would um, uh, they would march and protest at funerals and carry just vulgar signs. And they were known, I would say, for their vulgarity and their and their really their ridiculous stance. And we ought to stand for something, and we ought to stand against some things, and we will as Christians and as Baptists, and the Independent Baptist Church who follows the Bible, we will be against some things. All right, this is not the message to preach all that we're against. We're against some things. But that doesn't mean that we have to walk on every sidewalk in Saginaw carrying a placard every time someone makes a mistake. Can they not see our grief sometimes? Can they not know a church they can come and find some grief for lost in the sin? Our grieving should typically precede our judgment. But then this one, even in times of God's judgment, we can experience God's intense mercy. Even in times of God's judgment, we can experience his intense mercy. No doubt, the single worst judgment from God in all of history. You have Sodom and Gomorrah for a city. You have the children of Israel with some judgments. You have other nations who have crumbled, and, and because of prophecy, I believe it's God's judgment. But I can think of no other time in human history that God has judged in this particular way, and he says he'll never do it again. But even in that time of intense judgment, I see God's intense mercy. He made a way of escape. And so you may feel, God, you're judging me right now, but you can still experience God's intense mercy. You can still experience what God has. And the last one is this. God gives mercy, not just to save us, but also to sustain us. God gives mercy, not just to save us, but also to sustain us. I'm so glad that the ark wasn't the end of the story. Noah built an ark. Done. Because it would have been a year and ten days of pain. But I see God's mercy all through that, like we talked about. God's mercy after that with a rainbow in the clouds. Because God gives mercy not just to save us. And Jesus on the cross was his mercy to save us, but also to sustain us day by day. So tomorrow when you go to work, God has mercy for that right there. When you go home tonight, God has mercy. Go to the doctor next week, God has mercy to sustain you. You get the bill in the mail in two days, God has mercy to sustain you. Get a flat tire, engine drops out of your car, God has mercy to sustain you. Someone makes a wrong choice, God has mercy to sustain us. I'm glad God's mercy is not just to save us, but also sustain us. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this account of Noah. Lord, thank you for your mercy. And Lord, may we have a perspective where we see your mercy. Lord, forgive us for those times that we would have been unhappy with what you brought us. Where we would have grumbled about the ark. But really the ark was the perfect vessel for your mercy. I wonder who would say, Brother Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Maybe it was a fact that what God is bringing as an ark, you've been grumbling about. And the vessel that God's bringing or God's timing has not been your timing, but God spoke to you. You said, Brother, how would you pray for me? Because now I want to see God's mercy and I want to see it for what it is. It's God's mercy. Would you pray for me tonight? Amen. 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 I wonder who would say, though, I'd spend just a little time tonight, you know, Brother, how I want to be like Noah. I want to be that dad, that mom, that son, that daughter. Chance to save my family. Lord, touch my heart. Would you pray for me that I'd be the one that walks with God? Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Amen. Amen.